All right, good evening, everyone. Dr. Randall Gates, board certified chiropractic neurologist, also a chiropractic physician at Gates Brain Health. Tonight, I'm doing a video on vestibular neuritis. If you have not recovered and you're in the chronic phase and you're still having dizziness or symptoms of uh, abnormal motion of the environment when you're turning your head, uh, this video may be of some help. The feedback I've received on other videos I've done on vestibular neuritis has been really, um, it's been nice. It's been good and I've received a number of thanks uh, for talking about the issue because it seems as though there's not a lot of information for vestibular neuritis sufferers who continue to have persistent dizziness and lots of times individuals see a lot of doctors, they see physical therapists and uh, if they don't respond to physical therapy, they're kind of told, you know, there's not much we can do. We don't really know what is going on. And so I hope in this broadcast, not only to help you understand more about vestibular neuritis for those who are not super familiar with it, uh, the pathophysiology of it, but then also for those who have been entrenched in the vestibular neuritis uh, journey, maybe some ideas or questions that you can talk to your doctor about. All right, and good evening to everyone who's joining. Um, I have here on my sticky notes uh, some citations. This article by uh, lead author Kim was really good regarding uh, prognosis on symptom recovery. So look at that if you're interested. Uh, anytime you see this author, Dr. Below, he's kind of one of the top five vestibular researchers in the world. Same thing with Bronstein. Uh, here, this is an fMRI study I'm going to talk about. And then this article by another Dr. Kim is rather excellent. Uh, this Dr. Kim is a neuroautologist, so a neurologist who's also basically an ENT. And their experience after getting or suffering with vestibular neuritis. I cited this article in a video I did last spring, but uh, I'm going to go back through some components of it because it's just a wonderful account of someone suffering with it who has a great knowledge of the disorder. And good evening, good evening. Okay, so we're gonna, hopefully I can get rid of widgets. Let me see here, sticky notes. There we go. Now that's gone. Go to the end, I'll show on screen. So again, here's my name, and this is what we are talking about. Okay, so we'll hide that. Show this one in stream. So I love this diagram uh, because it's a great anatomical representation of the inner ear. Uh, the inner ear is composed of the vestibular labyrinth where we have three semicircular canals, an anterior canal, a posterior canal, and a horizontal canal. We also have these uh, areas called the utricle and the saccule. Simply, the three canals are meant to sense angular rotation largely and um, the utricle and saccule are more there to sense uh, linear acceleration movements. So you can also see that different areas of the vestibular labyrinth are innervated by different portions of the vestibular nerve. So the superior vestibular nerve innervates largely the anterior canal and the horizontal canal and the utricle while the inferior vestibular nerve innervates this structure called the saccule and the posterior canal. That may not be super important for you, but it's important for doctors, particularly in the process of trying to make an accurate diagnosis because vestibular neuritis is a condition from the time it starts, which is miserable. And we may as well go into that. The symptoms of vestibular neuritis are acute, prolonged vertigo. Differentiating vertigo from dizziness is very important here. So vestibular neuritis patients typically have true vertigo, room spinning around them, and it doesn't stop. So anyone who's never had vertigo from a condition per se, um, maybe you've been at a carnival and you've been on one of those Gravitron type rides where they spin you and they spin you and spin you and you get off of it and the world is just spinning, spinning, spinning. Well, that is what a vestibular neuritis patient experiences in the early phase of the condition, and it doesn't go away in 30 seconds, it doesn't go away in a minute, it may take days for it to go away. 
frequently associated with vomiting, frequently associated with much difficulty, if not inability to walk. And uh, lots of times vestibular neuritis patients end up in the emergency room because it is so serious. Now, um, as I mentioned here, it can affect the superior, inferior vestibular nerve. It can affect both, but most commonly it affects the superior vestibular nerve. Uh, then the next most common is are both territories, and then the least common is the inferior territory. Um, and yeah, symptoms do get worse with movement. So I think that summarizes that. We're going to hide. Let me see if I can get the next one. So then we have the question, why does it happen? Um, it typically happens due to what is thought to be a reactivation of the herpes simplex virus type one. Uh, on autopsy studies, they found that about two thirds of people uh, who die have this herpes simplex virus one in their vestibular ganglia. And so it's thought that a reactivation of that virus leads to the neuritis, also it used to be referred to as neuronitis uh, process. And so they've also done studies recently, uh, MRI scans of vestibular neuritis patients, and they see differences in the density of the vestibular nerve in neuritis patients in about half of neuritis patients, which leads us into a whole nother discussion because some people think there's an autoimmune component. I've talked about that before. Some think it's a microvascular component. Some think it's a viral reactivation. Maybe it's a confluence of, confluence of all three. Um, and that's probably, excuse me, that's probably more what it is. Um, but it, it's hard to say exactly what is going on in each individual, but those are the three leading theories. Uh, okay, and I think that pretty well summarizes that. Okay, so we'll hide this one and we'll go to the medical model. So when an individual has this acute phase of vestibular neuritis, Again, typically most commonly involving the superior vestibular nerve. <clears throat> it's the job of the ER doctor to differentiate this acute prolonged vertiginous syndrome from something like a stroke. How do they do that? Uh, the main test that is used is called the head impulse test. And so if this is your head, this is your brain, but I don't have a skull here. So if this is your head, the ER doctor will oftentimes move the head quickly like so, in what's referred to as the head impulse test, it used to be referred to as the Halmagi head thrust test after Dr. Halmagi, a great vestibular ENT researcher. And what we're doing there is we're trying to activate the inner ear, your vestibular system to see by moving the head quickly, do the eyes move appropriately in the opposite direction of the head? So your inner ear's primary function is to keep your eyes stable. So if you're running, and you're going up and down, or you're turning your head side and side while you're walking, the vestibular system is moving your eyes in a matter of milliseconds, somewhere on the order of five milliseconds, maybe seven milliseconds. From the time you move your head, your eyes are being moved to stabilize your field of vision. Whereas if you voluntarily are trying to move your eyes, you might be on the order of 200 milliseconds, maybe 150 milliseconds. Some people it's 300 milliseconds. So the vestibular system is way faster at controlling your eye movements than are higher areas of your brain. So say all that to say, the main uh, test that doctors are using is the head impulse test where they're turning the head quickly because they're looking to see, do the eyes have a lag and do they not move appropriately and is there something called a catch-up saccade? Now you have three semicircular canals. So you have an anterior canal, you have a horizontal canal, you have a posterior canal. So the doctor is likely gonna move the head into different positions like so, back, side to side, looking at these different canals, trying to see, is there a difference? If your head impulse testing is normal, most likely the conclusion is that you don't have neuritis and it's probably some type of stroke and you need an MRI. Unfortunately, MRIs and acute uh, brainstem and cerebellar syndromes may miss an acute stroke 12 to 20% of the time. So that's not perfect as well. Uh, doctors are also going to be looking to see, do you have horizontal nystagmus? And usually it's a torsional nystagmus in vestibular neuritis. You may have a skew deviation where one eye is high and one eye is lower. So they're looking at all these signs in conjunction with, do you have other signs? You know, is your leg weak? Can you not move your arm? Is one side of your face numb? All of those symptoms and signs are going to lead a doctor towards stroke or towards neuritis. 
But basically the head impulse test is one of the primary uh, objective measures that they are using. So hopefully you have a better understanding of what your doctors are doing because so many people are really sick. They may be given benzos, antihistamines, antiemetics. Uh, they may be given antivirals and prednisone. There's a lot of controversy whether uh, vestibular neuritis patients should get uh, antivirals and prednisone. It seems to be the mainstay treatment, but a lot of researchers say it's not really effective, but doctors are still doing it because they're trying to help the patient in some way. Um, so once an individual comes out of this very acute phase, and you know, some people manage this at home, but other people are in the hospital dealing with this. So once an individual comes out of the acute phase, maybe now they're all, they're able to sit up in bed without horrible vertigo. Maybe they're able to start walking with assistance in a couple of days, three days. And now they may be discharged home on the antivirals and the prednisone. And now it becomes a matter of what's referred to as vestibular compensation. So vestibular compensation, and let me minimize this and bring this in, is really, really important. And I have it under here in the, in the functional model, but the physical therapy model is gonna do the same thing to a certain extent in this phase of the condition, excuse me where we have to try and get the brain to compensate for the lack of signals from the inner ear. So um, how to describe this? In essence, if you're trying to have good vestibular compensation, a person does not wanna be in a vestibularly suppressed state. So in a vestibular suppression uh, protocol. So lots of times individuals are taking these meds like the benzos, the vestibular suppressants, trying to help them mitigate the nausea and all the negative symptoms of the vertigo. But there has to be a point where doctors then take the individual out of the vest vestibular suppressant phase and try to get them compensating. So we get patients compensating by having them move around. We want them doing eye head movements. We want them turning their head while they're walking, things like that. So those are the standard vestibular exercises that neuritis patients are given. And if you've had neuritis, you probably have been given those. The issue is, is that upwards of 30 to 50% of neuritis patients have this chronic dizziness at the one year mark, which raises the question, that the vestibular compensation did not happen appropriately and was not ideal. So that's where we're now at the point of, okay, here's the meat and potatoes, hopefully, for all of you vestibular neuritis patients who are still suffering at one year's time. Um, in the functional model, we really wanna dig in and do more VNG testing, video nystagmography. That's putting goggles on you, looking at your eyes in the dark and also with head movements. The reason being is that I think it's around 30% of uh, vestibular neuritis patients have not fully compensated well with dynamic testing at the one year mark. And what we can see is that maybe your brain stem where the vestibular nuclei are not compensating. So they're not able to overcome the lack of signals coming from the damaged vestibular nerve or the damaged vestibular nerve is has compensated to a certain degree. Sometimes this can happen and it's as though your brain stem is compensated, but also the nerve is starting to kind of regrow for all intents and purposes and it's starting to function more normally. So now you have a hyper function on the side that used to be low. And so with the VNG evaluation, I can't tell you what you have, but it's so important that you have the VNG evaluation with a, a doctor who really knows what they're doing is really interested in this to see what is your brain showing? How is your brain compensating? Do you, do you still have head impulse testing that's abnormal? Do you still have a weakness of that inner ear with caloric testing? That's where we inject warm or cold air into the ear and we see, is that nerve functioning normally or is it not? Is the nerve damaged? Is it not? We can tell that with caloric testing. And then from that, we can also say, okay, well, let's start giving this person a more specific compensation protocol with eye movements that maybe they've been given. The example is you can go online and you can look at a workout routine that tells you to go into the gym and you need to do four sets of bench press and then you need to do five sets of uh, bicep curls and you need to run on the treadmill for 30 minutes. That's a generalized routine. It's probably gonna help some people. But if you have maybe some injuries, maybe if you have 
some other ailments, you might want to consult with someone who really knows what they're doing to help you get to your fitness goals. It's so analogous, and I know that sounds maybe cheesy, but it's so analogous for rehabbing a vestibular system, rehabbing a brain that's damaged. You really want to have a keen interest and knowledge of what is exactly going on in the individual. And if you do that, maybe you can create a more specific vestibular rehab protocol for the individual. So that's my take and my experience. I'm working with vestibular neuritis patients. I'm not saying mine is better. I'm just saying that's my take. And to bring some more, um, let me hide this. To kind of just further go through what I was saying. And the dynamic signs are really, really important at looking at, let's say after three months to one year to 20 years after having uh, vestibular neuritis. If you're not recovered, you really want to look at the dynamic vestibular neuritis signs, like head shaking nystagmus. So we shake someone's head side to side, and we're looking to see what their nystagmus looks like. We also look to see, do they have post head shake nystagmus? All these indicators can tell us the integrity of their vestibular system. Vibration induced nyst nystagmus. So you can take a little tuning fork, put it on the sternocleidomastoid muscle, and you can see, is there a change in nystagmus with that procedure? Why does that have an effect? It's because the neck muscles lots of times are compensating when there's a weakness of the vestibular system. So the neck muscles tighten up trying to give the brain feedback what's going on. So if you put vibration on the neck muscle or the tendon, it can change feedback and then that can lead to nystagmus coming up. Caloric paresis, like I talked about. So injecting the warm and cold air into the ear. Um, those are the things that I try to look at. The static vestibular signs, like do you have nystagmus in the dark or are your eyes tilted? It's called ocular torsion or subjective visual vertical changes. Those tend to resolve within three months. Okay. So this is a great study. Um, this is the fMRI study I mentioned where they took vestibular neuritis patients and they did this, what's called a co-directional signal where they injected the ear with warm or cold air. I believe in this situation, they're doing warm air. And at the same time, they were having the patients look at an optokinetic stimulus. Optokinetic stimuli are basically these black and white bars Sometimes you can have dots going past you. Think of driving down the freeway and you're looking at telephone poles alongside the freeway and you look at one telephone pole after another. That's an optokinetic stimulus. So they had the optokinetic stimulus going the same direction basically as the direction of stimulation for the inner ear. And they also did it the opposite direction too. But the main finding was when they did this co-directional signal, optokinetic going the same direction as the eyes would be moving because of stimulation from the inner ear. What they found was that the primary visual cortex did not light up as much as it did in controls for the neuritis patients who still had persistent symptoms. What this means is that the visual cortex has great importance in mitigating your symptoms when you are a chronic vestibular neuritis suffer. And if the visual cortex is not strong, it probably correlates to why you're still having symptoms. <clears throat> so we like to think of vestibular disorders as just being uh, a vestibular disorder. You had damage to your superior vestibular nerve. It doesn't recover or it does recover. Your brain stem compensates or it doesn't compensate. But we tend to think so locally and the brain is much more complicated than that. The brain, as my mentor would refer to, uh, Dr. Carrick, is multimodal. There are so many interconnections in our brain, it's almost impossible to describe. But what we do know is that vestibular disorders have many, many connections within the brain, deep in the brain, and to the visual cortex, and to the temporal lobes, and to the cerebellum. So what they saw here is that the brain higher up, not just down in the brainstem. The brain was higher up in the visual area was not compensating well, not activating right, when we had this co-directional signal. And thinking of it practically, we know that a lot of vestibular neuritis patients don't compensate fully. They have abnormal head impulse thrusting tests a year later. And so it, what does that mean? It means they're moving their head and their eyes are not moving equivalently to their head movement. So that person's going throughout their day-to-day -day routine, they're bending over, they're turning to the right to talk to their kids, 
or turn to the left and their eyes are not moving correctly and it's making them feel weird, making them feel dizzy. And it may in part also be because their visual cortex way high up in the brain is primary visual cortex is not functioning as well. If that primary visual cortex was functioning better, maybe their symptoms would be less. And that's what they found that vestibular neuritis patients who had more visual cortical activation had less prolonged symptoms. So the point or the take home points hopefully are that you have better understanding of vestibular neuritis, that you know some of the dynamic uh, signs to look for at, if you're not better in the three month to one year mark, you can talk to your doctor about this, maybe bring this information to your doctor. And then I would really be looking for someone like a functional neurologist or a physical therapist who has a keen interest in uh, vestibular rehabilitation, who really is looking at higher order processing of vestibular signaling or vestibular stimuli. So it's not just an inner ear problem, it becomes a brain problem. And I've even seen autoimmune issues in chronic vestibular neuritis sufferers. So maybe the cerebellum is not compensating. I mean, they see many areas of the brain actually become more dense after vestibular neuritis because the brain is trying to compensate. It's like you trying to hold on to a stagecoach where the, there's stronger horses on the left and weaker horses on the right. So you're, you're pulling as hard as you can. That's what the brain is doing after damage to the vestibular nerve. So I hope this helps you. Uh, send me your, your feedback, your questions. And, um, and again, more topics to discuss with your doctor, more things to think about, more uh, information that you have at your disposal to maybe find the right doctor to work with to help your brain compensate, not only at the level of your brain stem and cerebellum, but also higher up in your brain. Okay, everyone, thank you for watching. Thanks for joining, and I will talk to you soon.